Look over at somebody and tell them, you see this? The Lord did this. I didn't used to look this good. <laughs> While you're there, remind them that tonight they are in the right place at the right time. Hallelujah. You know, it's a Friday night. This place is packed out. I can't imagine what it looks like on a Sunday morning. I hope you are making plans to build a building or add services or do something. My goodness. Aren't you glad to know that God is moving at Elkhorn Baptist Church and you guys are about to turn this place upside down for the glory of God? Amen. You know, one of the things that you need to be thankful for as you're a part of this church is for the leadership that he's given you. Um, I travel a lot. I'm in a lot of different churches. Matter of fact, right now I'm in a swing where I'll be preaching 11 times in eight days. And there's a lot of places that I go to that maybe they have folks who understand systems and they understand leadership principles, but they're, they're missing something. They don't have the anointing of God upon their life. And you ought to give thanks to God for having a pastoral family that has the anointing of God upon their life and that they're seeking God with everything that's within them and that they want more of God this year than they had last year. So if you appreciate Pastor Brian and Dana, I want to give you as a church a chance to honor them and to bless them and to let them know you love them and that you're grateful to call them pastor. Come on, give it up to Jesus for the gifts that he's put in your life. They are gifts that he's put in your life. Amen and amen. I want you to stay standing. I want you to stretch your hand towards them. He's always blessing you with the word. He's always blessing you in prayers, and he's, he's there for you when you need him. I want you just to pray a blessing on him. Let, let the Lord lead you, guide you, direct you as you bless him right now. Fa I want you to verbalize it. Speak it out loud. Father, we bless Pastor Brian and Dana, their entire family. We call them blessed in the city. We call them blessed in the field. We declare that they'll be blessed coming and going, that they will be the head and not the tail, and that every enemy that raises his hand against them will be smitten by you, God. I pray, Father, that there will be a hedge of protection round about them, that, God, they will prosper, that, Father, no sickness will be able to come near them, that their minds will be renewed, that, God, as they come into this new year, that there will be expanding vision that comes into them, and that, God, you will put people around them like the Aaron and the hers of old who will grab their arms and say, we are with you, we got your back, we will war with you in prayer. God, we thank you that there are greater things that are yet to come and that eye has not seen it, ear has not heard it, heart hath not comprehended it. It is exceedingly great. It is abundantly above all we can ask or think, and it will be birthed through them for such a time as this as unity comes into this house behind their leadership as they follow you, Jesus, in the shadow of the cross. In Jesus' name, this church said, amen. amen. Come on, give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you realize that Elkhorn Baptist Church is as small as it's ever going to be? And that if you are connected and plugged into this church, there is the least amount required of you right now as there is ever going to be required of you. There are greater things that are yet to come, and you got a ringside seat for it. Amen? Amen. Uh, we talked last night about the turn, and uh, that was based out of Acts chapter 17, verse 6. It says this, These that have turned the world upside down, have come here also. I want to kind of pick up tonight where we les left off uh, yesterday evening. And I, I believe that those that have turned the world upside down have come to Campbellsville also. And I think Satan is having some 911 meetings trying to figure out what he's going to do in order to stop the move of God that is transpiring. Amen. I don't know if it's safe for me to preach tonight. I got a bunch of three trees folks hanging out behind me. I'm not used to them hanging out this close to me. Amen. You know, uh, in 1998, I stepped onto uh, Russell County Mighty, Mighty Laker basketball court for the last time. I remember standing in the tunnel and uh, uh, standing to the front of the team, getting ready to lead them out onto the court. And I'm thinking, this is the last time that I am ever going to play before this home crowd. And I just had adrenaline pumping through me in ways that even to this day I don't even know how to describe. Uh, matter of fact, you know white boys can't jump. And I remember leading my team out and dunking the basketball through the lineup layups. And so 
uh, the, the, the tip off came and, and uh, our center got the tip. He, it, it was tipped over to one of our guards who passed it to one of our forwards who happened to catch me, number 14, streaking into the lane and I laid it up and in. We were playing Danville and they grabbed the basketball, they stepped out of bounds, they started to pass it into their guard, I jumped into the passing lane, I grabbed the ball, turned around, reverse layup, made the shot, got fouled, went to the free throw line, made the free throw shot. They got the ball, took it out of bounds, went down, shot and missed. Our forward grabbed the ball, passed to one of our guards, who once again caught a streaking Eric Gilbert. Towards the goal, I laid it up and in. If you were keeping score, that's Eric 7, Danville 0. Their coach called a timeout. As he was gathering his team, our coach was gathering us. My coach met me at half court. True story. He grabbed me by my jersey. He looked at me and he said, Gilbert, would you please tell me why you ain't played like that for the last four years? I said, well, coach, I was planning on going out with a bang. I said, I believe God wants to take his church out with a bang. Every part of me refuses to believe that God desires for hell to be more populated than heaven. I believe that we serve a God who fully desires to see hell plundered and heaven populated. But in order for that to take place, God desires to use you. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we find one of the ways that God wants to use us. It says that the Holy Spirit would come up on them and give them power and that that power wouldn't just come to their life so that they could be extremely gifted though that would be one thing that would come with the Holy Spirit it also says that it came to them so that they could be witnesses witnesses into Judea and Samaria even Jerusalem and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the earth aren't you glad to know that South Central Kentucky is a part of the uttermost end of the earth and that that's on God's map and so what happened in Acts chapter 26, we talked just briefly about it last night, is that there's a, a man by the name uh, of Saul, and he's persecuting the church, and he, he, he's traveling to Damascus with intention to further persecute the church. But he sees a vision, and in the vision is Jesus. And he falls to the ground, and he's literally blinded by what he has experienced. He's taken to a home. He spends three days there. And a man by the name of Ananias comes to him with a word from the Lord and lays hands on him and said, You are going to receive your sight, and you are going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. The reason he was receiving the power of the Holy Spirit is because because when he got the revelation of Jesus, Jesus gave him a very clear purpose. And that was you are to do three things above all else. You are to turn darkness to light. Can I get a witness? To turn darkness to light. Is there anybody in here that believes our culture needs to experience a turn from darkness to light? Second thing that Paul was told that he was supposed to do was that he was supposed to overturn Satan's power with God's power. The third thing he was told that he was supposed to do is that he was supposed to turn sin towards forgiveness in Jesus, which we ultimately know would be salvation. And so Paul was not the only one that received this purpose from God and received an empowerment from the Holy Ghost to bring it to pass. There were a multitude of others that experienced it as well. Matter of fact, there were 120 in an upper room in Acts 2 that got that same empowerment. And here's what came out of that. When they started trying to describe what was taking place in the areas surrounding what's recorded in the book of Acts, the only way they could describe them is to say, these that have turned the world upside down have come here also. Wouldn't it be something if they got to the point where that they couldn't just describe us by our denominational affiliation, that they couldn't just describe us by the name of our church or by which particular leader we were following, but they literally began to describe us as those that are turning the world upside down are coming here also, that our culture gets turned upside down, that our government gets turned upside down. I want you to know something. We're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. He has already moved sovereignly. When he released the Holy Ghost, he never took it back. He left the Holy Ghost here so that he could get on the inside of you. And so I think sometimes we're, we're, we're getting down in our prayer closet and we're rocking back and forth before the Lord as we well should. But we're praying things like, where's the God of Elijah? Where's the God of Elisha? Where's the God of Peter and James and John? What if God is asking where are the Simon Peters? Where are the Johns? Where are the Elijahs? 
Listen, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but a lot of church folk can't even handle a bad parking place. Tell them they don't get to do their thing at the time they want to do it. And they'll get mad, take their foreign some more, go somewhere else and try. Well, but I believe that the Lord is looking for some people who are arriving, are arising beyond the mundane. And that they're not a people who are fickle or easily offended, but they're mad at hell. And nothing is going to keep them from being on a mission to turn darkness to light. Darkness to light, the turn. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 makes this statement. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Would you just say that out loud with me? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Let me explain to you why that's extremely important. Because two verses later, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the scriptures say this. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You know, catch that. The wrath of God is revealed when truth is suppressed. I'm going to say it again. The wrath of God is revealed, according to Romans 1.18, when the truth of God is suppressed. Why is it so important for us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because if we become ashamed or we become embarrassed, the enemy has thereby suppressed the truth. And the repercussions of that are that there could be the wrath of God released. Now, I don't know if you've ever really looked at Romans chapter 1, but if you do, you will find that there is a downward spiral that is released. And what happens is that in verses 22 and 23, the Bible says that, that, that the Romans began to, to give themselves over to idolatry. And, and because they were pursuing idolatry, verse 24 literally says that God gave them up to sexual immorality. Now, watch this. Truth got suppressed. And the, and, and the culture, the nation, the generation, the Roman people began to pull against God towards idolatry. And God said, if you want to leave me that bad, then I'll let you go. And when he let them go, they went into sexual immorality. But it didn't stop there because sexual immorality wasn't enough for their fleshly indulgence. They kept pulling away from God. To the point that the Bible says they turned the truth of God into a lie. And God said because of that, he gave them over to homosexuality. So here's what's happening. There's a downward progression happening. I want you to envision it like this. That the Holy Ghost loves everybody. Would you agree with that? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed would not perish but have everlasting life. And God for our own sake tries to keep us from sin but he has given us a free will. And we have the ability to make choices. And what we forget sometimes is that choices come with consequences. And so imagine that there was this generation of people who they, they were trying to pull against God. And he was saying, don't, don't leave holiness. Don't leave righteousness. But they kept pulling to the point that he gave them up. And the first step in a downward spiral of darkness was sexual immorality being openly embraced in a culture. And they kept pulling against God to the point they turned the truth of God into a lie and He gave them up again. And that time, it wasn't just sexual immorality, but it was specifically homosexuality that became prevalent in that culture in Romans chapter 1. It says that after this, they still refused to acknowledge God. And the next thing that happens in verse 28 is it says He gives them over to a debased or a reprobate mind. That's just a funny word for literally meaning that the God consciousness was removed from them. So now think about this. God is saying to them, if you don't even want to think about me, if you don't want to have a consciousness of my will for your life, then I can take that from that culture. Now, if Romans chapter 1 is a picture of what can happen to an individual or it's a picture of what can happen to a nation or it's a picture of what can happen to a generation. If you look at the United States of America, 
just for a moment, consider with me where we might be on that staircase. In the 60s, we were given over to sexual immorality. And we continued to pull against God as a society. And now we see that there are homosexuality agendas that are becoming increasingly prevalent, prevalent in our culture to the point that it is literally affecting this inaugural prayer that's getting ready to come up. And we're still continuing to pull against God in so many segments of our culture. And Scripture says clearly in verse 28 that if God hasn't gotten your attention by that point on the staircase, the next step is to have a God consciousness completely removed from that culture. You ought to thank God that sin still bothers you. You ought to thank God for the fact that there's something in you that still says, I want God and more of Him today than I had yesterday. So... What I, what I am concerned about for our culture is that we could be increasingly moving toward the lack of a God consciousness in the decisions that we make and in the way in which that, which that we, we, we release our propaganda, in the way in which we form our laws. And here's what happens after that. It goes on to say that in verse 29, when the God consciousness was removed, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, ma maliciousness, gossip, slander. They became haters of God. They were insolent. They had pride. Watch this. It literally says they became inventors of evil, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Does anybody in this place want your kid to grow up in that kind of culture? I'm going to ask you again, does anybody in this place want your kid to grow up in that culture? When I read that passage of Scripture, i got a 7-year-old baby girl sitting at home and a 5-year-old baby boy waiting on Daddy to get home and tuck them in tonight. And I can't imagine the thoughts of my babies growing up in a society that is completely filled with all manner of sin and that nobody would even be bothered by it. Because in verse 32, it goes on to say that what happened is the culture began to speak in an approving way of the sin that was taking place. They gave it approval. How many of you would agree with me that we need a turn? We need a turn. That instead of going from one level of sin to a deeper level of sin and a deeper level of sin, that we need to turn around and begin to ascend from faith to faith and from glory to glory, from righteousness to righteousness in our God. That instead of getting farther from Him, that we are drawing nigh to Him and He is drawing nigh to us. Anybody in this place want that? Glory to God, let it take place. May they that have turned the world upside down come here also. You ought to just look at somebody and tell them, they that have turned the world upside down are coming here also. And I'm one of them. Amen. You may be seated if you'll slap somebody a high five and tell them, I'm one of them. Listen, young people, I believe that God wants to send you back into the hallways of your school system to turn darkness to light. And when they look at you with self-righteous stares and they condemn you with the persecution of the peer pressure, that you'll make your back like a T-rail and make a decision that greater is he that is in me than he that is within the world. If God gets me in, God will get me out. Hey, my father used to work for the state. And there came a moment where he was a, he was a supervisor and he would always uh, bless his meal and he prayed out loud when he would do that. And there was a man that went to his superior and filed a complaint and they said, he, he makes me feel uncomfortable when he's praying. And the whole time that this petition was filed against my father, he just kept sitting down at his meal, opening up his bag lunch and blessing it out loud, praying over it. This is a, this is a true story. By the time that thing was said and done, the other fella got transferred. My father had his job title changed, and the impending result of that was they gave him a $4 on the hour raise. I'm telling you this right now. If praying gets you into trouble, praying will get you out of trouble. I'm looking for a Shadrach, a Meshach, and an Abednego that when thousands have bowed their knees and compromised, they'll stand there and declare, if God be for me, who can be against me? There's a fourth man that's about to show up and walk in this generation by the power of the Holy Ghost. I feel like 
preaching. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Tell somebody, I'm one of them. Daniel, if they threaten to throw you in the lion's den, remind them that there's a greater lion and he's from the tribe of Judah and he's roaring on the inside for such a time as this. You ain't seen nothing yet. Greater things are yet to come. Greater things. All God is looking for is somebody that will yield to him. And there are those of you who are in this place and you've been wrestling with a conviction in your heart and a conviction in your life and you don't even really know how to understand or comprehend or communicate to anybody what you feel. I know what it's like to run from God. And it's, my story's a little bit different than some. But I, I tell people when I grew up in, in church, see, uh, I mean, when I was growing up, the only drug problem I ever had is that my parents drugged me to church whether I wanted to go or not. When you hear the story of somebody cutting their teeth on the back of a pew, I'm that kid. I remember growing up in a church and, 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 and the, the ladies would go to shouting. And my mama would have to grab me and pick me up out of the floor to keep me from losing a limb to somebody's high heels. And so at seven years old, I was sitting on the front row of a, of a, of a church building and, and, and the, the, the altar call was given. And I remember as though it was yesterday, I mean with great clarity, knowing I had to go and going and bowing at that altar and crying before the Lord and admitting at seven years old that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. At 12 years old in that same church house, I was sitting in Sister Eva Ray's class and she was going through the Sunday school lesson. And God began to deal with me that someday I was going to preach the gospel. And I remember coming out and, and, and sitting in the service. And, and, and while the, there's a fellow by the name of Brother Garrett. And he had his guitar and he is singing. And I'm thinking about, I'm going to preach the gospel someday. And I had an experience with the Holy Ghost sitting on the second row of that seat. And I think back to that day at 12 years old in that church sanctuary and what God did in me. But I went back to school and I told some of my buddies, someday I'm going to preach. They didn't find that very amusing. And, and immediately I began to feel this pressure of, I, I, can't, I can't be that. I want to be something. And I, the next six years of my life, I consciously ran from God. I honestly believe that there was not hardly a moment that, that, it, that at some, let me rephrase that, at some, not hardly a day, that at some point I didn't have this pulling in me of you have got to yield to the Lord. And I, I was being somewhat rebellious with my parents. And at the same time I'm dealing with this inside me, the Lord calling me. And I didn't want them to know that I was reading the Bible. So I would wait until they went to bed because I thought they'd think I was a hypocrite, you know, because I'm yelling at my parents, slamming doors in their face. And I'd wait for them to go to bed and I had this little New Testament that had Proverbs and Psalms in the back of it. And I would sit up at night and I would read that, sometimes with a flashlight. And by the time I was 17 years old, I had read the New Testament and Psalms through multiple times, at the same time running from God. I described some of you Maybe not in the exact terminology or the exact scenario, but you've been with God and running from Him at the same time. This inner struggle on the inside of you, this pull, this tug, and you've been absolutely miserable. You know why? Because it's better to have never known the way than to have known it and tried to depart from it. The most miserable people on the planet are people who are running from God and know that they are. If you've been running from God and you've found yourself in this place tonight, I'm going to challenge you to finally pull over and let God be God. For me, I had come to the point where I decided I didn't want to be a preacher at 18 years old. And I had received a scholarship to pursue engineering. And I was driving to school. And on those drives back and forth from home to school, the Holy Ghost started messing with me. And there was a point in my life when I could take you from A squared plus B squared equals C squared to the Pythagorean theory, or the, to the quadratic formula and back to the Pythagorean again. And then all of a sudden, I sitting in class. And all I could think about 
is this is not what you were made to do. God's not ordained you to build roads and bridges. He's ordained you to preach the gospel. And I'm I'm wrestling with all that. And so, one day on the way to school, I was almost towards the end of the semester, headed up the Cumberland Parkway. And I had my bag of books sitting in the passenger seat of the car. I was driving a 1986 Delta Oldsmobile with the Cadillac converter cut off of it. It sounded like a freight train coming. And if you went through McDonald's or Wendy's, you had to open the door because the window wouldn't roll down. It was a chick magnet. (laughs) And at mile marker 82 on the Cumberland Parkway, one day I pulled that car over. As I felt like the Lord was saying to me, Eric, if you'll move that book bag, I'll overwhelm your life. And here's the thing. For me, those books represented what was standing between me and God. I was chasing the wrong path, chasing the wrong agenda. Nothing wrong with an education, but for me, it represented running from God. I will never forget grabbing that book bag, pulling it out of that seat, throwing it behind me, and before I could get it laid behind me, the Holy Ghost came over my life. And I started weeping and crying and bawling like a baby. I had other friends that were traveling the same road. They started pulling over on the side of the road, thinking I had car trouble, seeing me crying, trying to figure out what's wrong with you, and I'm having to open the door because the window won't roll down. And wait, Oh, it's just God, man. I don't even know how to just God. Just, you ever just had a, it's a just God moment and you didn't even know how to explain it? The experience was beyond words? You walk in to my office to this day and you look over the couch and there's a sign that hangs. Mile marker, 82. No, I didn't steal it. I know people. And when I'm having a bad day, and a moment when pastoring a church isn't so much fun. And Beulah's mad. And Freddie's sending me ugly emails. I look over there. And I remember 14 years ago, pulling over on the side of the road. And God promising me he wouldn't appoint me to anything he wouldn't anoint me to. And he wouldn't call me to anything he wouldn't qualify me for. And that if I'd just keep everything out from between me and him, he would keep bringing power to my life that would be beyond anything I could comprehend. I don't know if you've ever had a Damascus Road experience, sir, ma'am, but tonight might be your night when you finally pull your life over and let God be God. Just look at somebody and ask them, would you let go and let God It's decision time. See, some of you, tonight you stop running. You pull over. You finally have that revelation of Jesus unlike anything you've ever known. And feel the Holy Ghost come over you. And the darkness in you being turned to light. And the Satan's power of things like addiction being overturned in you as God's power is released. And your sin being taken away as the salvation of Jesus comes to your heart. You feel it on the inside of you. Little boy. Down to the VBS. Got saved. Went back to school. He told all of his buddies. I got saved last night. They said, how do you know you got saved? Did you see a vision? I said, no. (laughs) Did you hear a voice? Audible voice? No. How do you know you got saved? I said, the only way I know how to describe it is it's like when we're down at Papa's Pond. And you can't see the fish. And you can't hear the fish. But you can feel him tugging on your line. And for some of you tonight, it's like there's a string attached to this cross. 
and something's reeling you in. And you feel it drawing you, tugging you. It's Jesus reminding you that you haven't done so much that he can't still forgive you. That's God in heaven reminding you that heaven's not done with you, that there's still a purpose in your life. These guys are going to come to this music, and as they begin to arrive, and they begin to, to create an atmosphere of worship in this house, Jesus is being lifted up, and the result is, is that he is drawing all men unto himself. What I've prayed tonight as I came into this place is that it would be one of those moments like transpired on the Emmaus Road. You see, there were two disciples, and they were walking with Jesus. And they got to the end of a seven-mile journey. And when they sat down, they said, I don't even know how to describe what happened in that walk other than the fact that everything that man spoke to us, Jesus Christ it was. His words burned within me. As I prepared for tonight, the thing that I prayed above all else is let the Word of God start to burn within somebody. To the point that you start turning over the tables of your life. You start making a decision. Like Jeremiah. It's a fire. Shut up in my bones. And I cannot resist it anymore. I cannot run from it anymore. I must yield myself to it. I'm going to ask you to stand with me to your feet. I'm going to ask every single person to just be in a mindset of reverence. Maybe that means that you would go as far as to bow your head, close your eyes. I don't know what it looks like for you, but I'm asking every single person to be in a mindset of prayer right now. And if you are in this place, and tonight is your Damascus Road experience, tonight is the night when you finally say, I am going to yield to God, that, 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 that I feel Him tugging on my line. I feel Him reeling me in. And I'm going to ask you to put your decision on public display. And to make a decision that tonight is the first night in the rest of my life. To make a decision that you're going to get out of your seat. You're going to make your way through an aisle. Even if you've got to tell somebody to get out of your way for a moment. That you're going to push your way through to the foot of this cross. And make a decision. Tonight I give my life to Jesus. And tonight, it's not just a moment that, that, is, that is casual or sporadic. You're saying, I'm going to follow Him with everything that is in me. I am done playing games with God. I'm done playing games with life. Do you realize that tonight we deal in the merchandise of eternity? With every second that is ticked off of the clock, every one of us have either gotten close into heaven or to hell. Why would you play with eternity? When Jesus has given you a clear escape route, there's an exit sign written in the red blood of Jesus. And all you got to do is to confess and bow before Him and make Him your Lord. Allow Him to lead your life. And you're thinking about, i got to get this fixed and i got to get that fixed. And it's the lie of Satan because you don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. There's nothing you can do to prepare you for this moment. It's simply yielding to Him. And if you need to be justified by grace tonight, if you need to have your slate wiped clean, if you need to have old things pass away and everything to become new, then right now, I'm going to ask you, come and bow at this cross. Come and put the cross at the forefront of your life. Jesus Christ, the only embarrassment that surrounds this moment took place 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ hang bleeding and dying before the humanity that He created so that we might be able tonight to experience salvation. Now, any, anybody in this place, surely if Jesus can walk up the rugged, cruel cross of Calvary, then surely you could take a walk and be willing to bow before a Savior that would love you with that kind of love. Surely, if he would allow them to pluck his beard from his face, to be whipped beyond human recognition, to have every joint of his body, Psalms 22 says, dislocated. Not a bone broken, but every joint dislocated. And he would hang there and bleed and die so that we could be saved from our sins. You say, did it take all of that? to save me from my sins you know there was a guy by the name of Alexander the Great and one day he was 
walking through the city city of a st streets of a town he had conquered and there was a beggar who wanted some money and Alexander the Great turned to his purse keeper and said bless him the purse keeper reached in and grabbed copper coins and handed them to the beggar and Alexander the Great rebuked the purse keeper he said you will not give him copper you will give him gold and the purse keeper said why I see his need copper is more than sufficient Alexander the Great said copper may match his need but only gold matches my generosity and I'm gonna tell you something something less than a cross might have got the job done but only the horrific nature of a cross could match the love that our God desired to display to us and there's something in you tonight that needs to yield to the love of God to know that he first loved you so that you can come and love him when I see every person we're gonna pray and as I pray and maybe even as they begin to sing in the background if you need to come I'm stepping back you need to come and bow your Damascus Road the moment when you pull your life over and say Jesus I'm all yours let's pray all across this house and if you need to come you come while we pray Heavenly Father God there are folks in this place that are hearing the lies of Satan he is deceiving them even up to this moment he's whispering to them that there's more time to get it worked out God I ask you to give them the reality and the revelation that I very well could be the last preacher they'll ever hear that this very well could be the last church they'll ever step foot in and God while that is in no way shape or fashion meant to be a scare tactic it is meant to be a shaking that would shake everything within us to realize that no man should play with eternity when Jesus Christ has made the opportunity for salvation so available through his cross father I pray if somebody needs to have the chains of hell broken over their life if they feel even now like they're pinned in God somebody that's bare knuckling the back of a seat right now thinking I'm gonna hold on God may they release themselves to you tonight God may they put their faith on display faith on display and come and bow before you come and bow before you if you haven't come yet, I want you to know that this altar is still open. This cross is still available to you. But here's what I'm going to ask us to do as a church. There are those of you that God wants to use to go back into your homes that are filled with darkness and turn it to light. There are those of you that God wants to use in this culture, even in South Central Kentucky, to begin to raise up against the sexual promiscuity and all the different stuff that's coming in in the form of darkness and see that the truth will not be suppressed as you receive a Holy Spirit empowerment to not be ashamed of the gospel. And if that speaks to your life and you say I want to be one of those that is turning darkness to light I want to be one of those that is turning Satan's world into God's kingdom for the glory of Jesus I want you to come and bow at this cross and if you've been holding on to your seat and thinking I should have come for salvation earlier I want you to slip out and come as well but if you're saying I want to be one of those I want to be one of those I want to be one of those that is empowered by the Holy Spirit turning darkness to light I'm asking you to come and respond and bow at this cross Father God, we bow as a church and we simply say to you that enough is not enough. We are hungrier for you, God, than we have ever been before. We are burdened for our culture. God, we are torn from the inside out for the fact that darkness is dimming the light. God, may there be a divine reversal that begins to take place and that light begins to overpower the darkness. That, God, you begin to use us for such a time as this to have an anointing upon our life that will destroy yokes. God, I pray for business owners that are bowed at this cross right now, that you will use them in their place of business God for managers and supervisors that you'll use them God to impact the people who are under their supervision God for people who feel like they're just another number on an assembly line that you will use them put a tangible touch of the anointing even in their life God I pray for students who are bowed at this cross and God they got to go back into a campus they got to go back into a hallway and it seems like they can be so on fire for you when they're inside a church building and then something starts taking place and they, and they, they start feeling as though that, that, that God they just can't stand for you as they start feeling the pressure of people around them God forcing them at times it feels like to make bad decisions God may they find the courage tonight to bow at your cross receive the Holy Spirit empowerment and go forth and be the light of the world that you have commissioned them to be 
God, I thank you tonight. I thank you tonight that we leave this place different than we came. In Jesus' holy name. Lord, we yield to you. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we magnify you. Lord, we want to be used by you. We're tired of status quo. We're tired of casual Christianity.